I, I hear so many people when life starts falling apart and it feels like the bottom just dropped out from under you, you question God, right? It, and it's a, it's a natural, it's a human, and we hate when we do it, but we do it anyways. And that song says, no, even if the circumstances don't change, you're, you're still holy. You're, you're still God. You're still on that throne. And I, and I think it's so significant because a lot of you, I, I, don't, know, I don't know how you come into the room today. You know, you, you may come in and, and all sorts of stuff is going on in your life. And I'm, I'm kind of scattered this morning. I, I just flew in from Washington, D.C. this morning. Okay. And last night, we did this conference with these college students and just thousands of college students. Great worship time. But before the last session, one of the leaders came in and he had a, a bunch of prayer requests from the students. And, and it, it changed everything for me because, okay, all I saw was thousands of college students. Okay, let's get them fired up. Let's go. Let's do something. We have these great bands. We're getting to worship everything else. But suddenly he reads their prayer requests and he goes, you know, let me just read a couple of these. First one, pray for me because um, I went to a party I shouldn't have gone to. I know I shouldn't have gone to that party. Um, it's not just the guilt from that, though. I was raped, and now I think I have AIDS. Pray for me. Next one. I've had this eating disorder for about five months now. It talks about these struggles. Next one. And he just starts reading prayer requests after prayer requests, in which each one I'm going, no way, no way. No way. And then suddenly it wasn't a crowd I was speaking to, but it was individuals. And sometimes I come to church and all I do is I see a thousand people singing. And it's a crowd of people here to worship God. And then I'll start talking to you as individuals. And I'll start hearing about your lives. And I'm going, no way. This week? No, yesterday that happened to you? Okay, so this is all just last night? Your whole world just fell apart. And, and, and don't, you, don't you love it when, uh, you, you know, those Sundays where you come in and you're struggling with something and then suddenly I'm speaking on that very topic. And you go, no way! How could that, has he been following me around all week? You know, and I've heard that question over and over. Did, did you know what's going on in my life? Because I can't believe you're talking about this. Because maybe I'm talking about addiction. And, and that was the very thing that you've had this battle with this week before the Lord. And go, I can't believe I was just about ready to, you know, quit everything and just give up. And then you talked about it. Or others say, you know, man, you talked about divorce that morning. I was, I was ready to leave my wife, you know, that week. And then you talked about divorce. You know, I walked into the church, you were talking about murder. I was just about to kill my husband that afternoon, and you talked about that very thing. You know, I mean, isn't it, uh, isn't it cool when whatever issue you're dealing with, suddenly someone gets up front and you're going, I can't believe he just said this after this week. Well, this morning, I'm going to talk about how big God is. And some of you guys are going, oh, shoot. I was hoping he'd address this. I was hoping he'd address this. I was hoping he'd address this. You guys, but it's my belief that having a high view of God is a solution to most of your problems. <laughs> it really is. You, you know how every, every preacher, whether we like to admit it or not, everyone has kind of their soapbox issue that they'll go back to and they'll keep preaching. And even if it doesn't fit the passage, they'll cram it in there because it's passionate in their heart. For, for me, if you've been here for any length of time, you'll know that something that's very important to me is how we view God. I, I think the biggest problem in the church today is we have such a little view of God. And when we say that word, we'll discuss him, we'll talk about him, we'll, we'll get in a classroom and, and, and try to come up with different points, talking and having these conversations about him, all the while forgetting that if we actually saw him, we would say nothing. And we just forget that. We forget that we would just be in awe. We forget that, that the people, when they saw God in this book, when they saw God, it was just like... It was not this whole... See, when you have a small view of God, crazy things start happening. When you have a little view of God, pretty soon you become ungrateful. 
You become ungrateful people when you have a small view of God because you don't realize what you have. And if you really understood, then you'd go, no way. He is for me. He loves me. He sent His Son to die. It changes everything. When you have a small view of God, pretty soon you, you start having these, you start having this belief like He was created for you. When you have a small view of God, you start going, man, you know what? He's not making me happy. If that's the way He is, I'm not... And you start saying these silly things because you don't understand who you're talking about. When you have a small view of God, it even gets to the point where people start judging Him. When you have a small view of God, you'll start judging God. You'll start going and saying, well, if He's so loving, then how come there's people starving? How come there's people dying of AIDS? How come there's no one to help them? And you'll have this attitude of, you're placed on this earth to judge God, rather than having a high view of God and realizing, wait a second, no, one day I'm going to stand before Him and He's going to question me and say, hey, if you were so loving, how come those people were starving over there? What did you do about it? See, but when we have a small view of God, we get this arrogance, like we question Him. And how come you didn't do this for me? How come God is like this? And that's why I'm like, you know what? That is our biggest problem in the church is when we have a small view of God. See, I I know that some of you would much rather me talk about your issues and dig into your life and the things you're dealing with. And I'm saying, no, trust me, this is better for you. It's better for you because, you know, when when Sarah was singing that song about, look, you know what, you're still holy, even when everything's falling apart, even when the circumstances aren't changing. I know you're still on your throne. It's interesting because in the Bible, in the Bible, uh, you know, we've talked about that passage in Isaiah 6. I mean, we've shared about it many times where Isaiah comes before the, the throne and he sees his throne and these angels are covering themselves up, screaming, holy, 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 all that's going on. But did you ever notice that first verse? And in Isaiah 6, verse 1, it says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. That's very significant. He says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I got this vision and I got to see the throne. See, King Uzziah was the king of Israel, and he was a great king. He was a powerful king. And if you study the history of Israel, you see, when they have a good king, a good leader, things are pretty good. When they have a bad king, things are pretty bad. Isaiah was, I'm sorry, Uzziah was their king for about 52 years. So for 52 years, pretty much your whole life, you've been under this king and go, man, this is a good period. Everything's good. Militarily, we're strong. No one can touch us. Things are powerful. We've got a great country here. And then suddenly Uzziah dies and it's like, "Uh uh-oh, what's going to happen to us now? I've read the history books. A bad leader is going to really screw up this country. A good leader, which we've had for 50 years, is good. And then God says to Isaiah in the midst of that, in the year that he died, he says, you know what? Forget about Uzziah for a second. Let me take you up into heaven. And let me show you this throne. See, the whole idea is Isaiah saw who was really on the throne. It doesn't matter who's the king on this little planet, you know, sitting on this throne with his little cute little army on the earth. He says, Isaiah, let me, let me get you beyond this. I want to take you to heaven. I want to show you what my throne looks like. And so then Isaiah says, no way. See, when he sees God, he just goes, oh, I'm dead. You're going to kill me. You know what I've done. And this is Isaiah, a prophet, pretty good guy. You know, and sometimes I read that and he goes, well, because I said some things that were bad. And I'm going, that's all you did? (laughs) Man, you want to see my list? You know? And he's just struck with the shame before this God. But the, the point of that passage, though, to me, so much is the timing of it. It's when his life was falling apart, God did not come down and counsel Isaiah and say, you know, tell me about your feelings about Uzziah dying. He says, no, come up here. Let me show you something bigger. See, here's the issue. I am not belittling what's going on in this room because like I said, it breaks my heart. Last night as I'm reading about what's going on in every student's life, man, 
my heart just breaks for them and I try to put myself in their shoes. When I talk to you guys between services and you tell me what's going on in your life, my heart's just breaking for you. Man, last service, you know, a guy comes up in a wheelchair, he got lung cancer and just, I got to make some decisions this week. I don't know. I don't know. I got I to have wisdom. You know, what do I do? Do I prolong it or whatever? And heavy stuff. I mean, beautiful thing was we start talking about his physical health and we start talking about his spiritual health. Then he realized, you know what, I need to get baptized right now. And I can't get in that water because of this wheelchair, but I go, that's okay, we'll just sprinkle you. God knows your heart. But you sure you believe this? Yeah, I'm sure. I need this in my life. You know, and I, I know there's, there's things going on. I'm just saying that the solution sometimes is not looking deeper at your problem. The solution is looking beyond that and seeing God on his throne and going, no way. Because I'm telling you, if, if I could supernaturally let you see God for five seconds this morning, you would not be thinking about your problems during those five seconds. <laughs> you would not be thinking about your problems for the rest of the day, the rest of the week, possibly for the rest of your life. It would be a sight where it would just take all your breath away because I've seen it in scripture over and over again. The people that encountered the God, I mean, they fainted. They fell on their faces. They just could not. Nothing can prepare you for what you're about to see. And there's something so good for us to just not just talk about God, not just discuss God, not just say, you know, I think he's like this. No, no, no. There's just something good about trying to imagine that moment when we actually see him and what our response will actually be. I, I want you to turn to the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel, <coughs> much like Isaiah, at the beginning of his ministry, at the beginning of his calling as a prophet, he gets to see God. And I just want us to, I just want, I, man, you know what, let me, let me pray right now. Because I, I don't want this just to be another morning, Okay. Nine o'clock, sometimes when nine o'clock goes so well, like our nine o'clock service was just awesome. And I, I, I don't know. It's almost like I'd prefer nine o'clock to not go so well because then in my head I'm thinking, okay, how can we really get people into it at 11 and I'm into it? You know, but sometimes when nine o'clock goes so well and we just met with God and we came into the presence of God, then you're like, oh, we can never have another service like that. It'll never go that good. And it's like, wait a second, why don't we pray and ask God for this? Because this is a whole new group of people, a whole new set of issues, a whole bunch of individuals with stories that I can't get all into this head. And I just want to pray that God would minister to each of you however he needs to this morning. Because I, you can't pull that off humanly. You can't just walk up on a stage and fix a thousand people's issues <laughs> or lead them as each person needs to lead them. That's something only the Holy Spirit can do. And I would just like to pray for that this morning. So would you guys join me in a word of prayer? God, I, I wish I could love on each person in this room, but I can't. I wish I knew every story and knew how to address it specifically. God, I'm asking for something supernatural to happen. I believe that if we all saw you, it would change everything. Everything. I mean, even for five seconds, if we could see what you were like, it would change everything. And God, I don't believe you're going to do that this morning, although I wish you would. Yet there's a, you give us your word and you give us these descriptions of you. And I pray that you would just in some way give us a glimpse of you. Maybe somehow even supernaturally you give us a new picture of you and what you're like. That we would give you a reverence that you deserve. I pray that we would not even say the word God in passing anymore. 
but that we'd recognize who we're talking about when we say that word. Just take us all on our own different journeys this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Ezekiel chapter 1, <coughs> verse 26. It says, above the expanse over their heads, and he's talking about these angelic beings he saw. He says, above the expanse over their heads was what looked like a throne of sapphire. And high above on the throne was a figure like that of a man. And I saw that from what appeared to be his waist up, he looked like glowing metal, as if full of fire. And that from there down, he looked like fire and brilliant light surrounded him. Like the appearance of a rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day, so was the radiance around him. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. When I saw it, I fell face down. Okay, so Ezekiel says, I, I see this being, in, and I don't know if you've read this description of God before, and, and, and I've read other descriptions of God as other people have seen him, and you'll notice there's a little bit of variation, but there's still this similar thought of this being on this throne that's glowing. And some authors, and, and don't you get the feel like he's, he's like wrestling for words? Because he goes, you know, like the upper half of him, he goes, he, it's like, it's like metal when it's burning, you know, when it's really bright and, you, you know, and it's just glowing and it's fire. He goes, so the upper half was like this burning fire and then the lower half was like, I don't know, I guess fire also. You, you know, it's just, he's trying to, he, he's just trying to use this description because how do you put in earthly terms someone who is holy? But the very word holy means he's set apart. He's like nothing else. So I don't know how to describe him. It's just, he's just glowing. I don't know what's the brightest thing you've ever seen. That's what it was like. I mean, nowadays we may say, you, you know, it's like a, a atomic explosion, you know, like how you, you can't even look upon him like, oh, I'll die. It, it's just this, that's what the upper half and I guess that's the lower half too you know it's just I don't know how to describe it you know when John in Revelation describes him he goes I don't know it wasn't like a person person it wasn't like flesh and blood it was like diamonds and rubies it's like jewels that are glowing and you know and, and, and then John you know it's just it's on and on and on you, you see these different descriptions and they're trying to describe this being on this throne and they're using these words and Ezekiel's just going I, I don't know. I've never seen anything like it. He goes, you know how on a rainy day when there's just suddenly this bright rainbow and you're like, ah, oh, that is so beautiful. It was like that too. He goes, that's, 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 yeah, that's another way to describe him. Like on a cloudy day and a rainbow shows up. That's what the glory was like. The, 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 the fire, the, the glowing metal, uh, the figure of a man, the throne was kind of like sapphire. He goes, I don't know. Bottom line, when I saw him, I just collapsed. That, that's it. I, I just, I just fell face down. Period. That's all I can say. And Isaiah describing the throne just goes, I, I just said, woe is me. I'm dead. I can't believe I'm in his presence. You see, that's what happens when you come in the presence of God. Okay, so can we just take a break from the sermons and everything else and just for a moment as a bunch of human beings, fellow human beings right now, just all collectively admit, Okay, right now in heaven, there's a being, and if we saw him, we wouldn't even know how to describe him. We wouldn't know what to say to him. We would just collapse. We would just fall on our faces. And so can you put your pride aside and think that you, you know, somehow could come before that God with all these questions and all these things that he's never thought about and just kind of be quiet and say, you know what? You're God in heaven. I'm just this thing on earth, and I'm just going to be quiet. That's what I love. I love that passage in Ecclesiastes 5. We've talked about this before. I'll throw it on the screen. Ecclesiastes 5, verse 1, where it says, Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Go near to listen rather than offer the sacrifice of fools who do not know that they do wrong. 
Do not be quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. God is in heaven and you are on earth, so let your words be few. You guys, we need to be reminded of this passage over and over and over again. Because sometimes we come into this room and we just want to say praises to God. We want to make commitments to God. We want to say, hey, God, sorry, I didn't really mean that this week. I will never do that again. We want to just open our mouths. And the Bible says that you need to be careful. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Don't, go, don't just start talking. That's, you know, that's the sacrifice of fools. If you come in this room right now and you just feel like you've got a ton of things to say, he says, you know what? That's what fools would do. What a wise person would do would be to recognize there's a pretty amazing being in heaven and I'm just this little person on the earth and so I'm just not going to say anything for a while. That's why we didn't start this weekend with a bunch of singing and words and promises. So, you know, let's just listen for a little bit. Let's just hear a description of what God is like. In fact, what we're going to do right now may be a little awkward for some of you. <coughs> we're going to have some silence. It's hard. And some of you, you you'll probably you can't stand it. You'll start texting your friends because you, you just you, you can't deal with silence. You can't deal with just thinking about me being this person on earth and this being in heaven, but we're going to try this. I'm going to have Diana come up and, and just play softly on the keyboard to just drown out the noise of your cell phones and our coughing and everything else just so that we could have some, uh, some peace this morning. And here's what I want you to do. <coughs> as, as Diana plays... We're not going to sing, okay? This isn't a singing time. There's going to be no words on the screen, nothing. And I don't, I don't want you to pray either. I don't want you to just go, hey, God, you know, hey, you know, this is so cool. You know, we're having like this quiet time. Thanks, man. You know, I, I don't just, just, I want you just to acknowledge that there's a being in heaven right now. And I want you just to understand your place before him. And I'm going to invite you to do something that may be uncomfortable for some of you. And so you're not forced to do it. But some of my best times of worship have not been the times when I'm screaming at the top of my lungs. Sometimes I like to just get on my knees. There's something about that posture. And I think it's so healthy for some of you. Because all week long you've been telling people what to do. You're the boss at work. You're the leader of your little division your home, your kids. And there's just something about, okay, but I know when I've met my match. And there's something about this posture that says, you know what, I don't have anything to say. You know everything already. You know everything in my heart. You know all my thoughts, so I'm just going to shut up. Because who am I? I'm just this person on the earth. And it's just something about collectively a group of people saying, you know what, God, we recognize you are the all-powerful being in heaven. That if I saw you right now on your throne where the upper half of you is like this fire burning metal and the bottom half, pretty much the same thing. And just this glowing being, this is what I would do if I were in your presence. And right now I believe I am in your presence. You're in heaven though, and I'm on earth. So I'm just going to be quiet. I'm just going to be quiet. And I'm just going to think about what you're like. And just envision yourself before the throne of God. So we're going to have a worship time through silence where you're invited to just bow down. Maybe you can turn around and just kneel on your seat. Maybe you want to come out in the aisles. Maybe you want to be up in front and just fall face down before God. Just don't say anything. Just acknowledge who you are before God and picture him in your mind. Isn't it refreshing to take your mind off of yourself for a second and look at someone so much bigger? I'm telling you, it is so healthy if we would just regularly, on your own, in the morning, just 
get a picture of God in your head and think about what in the world would I say if I saw this being, I mean, literally, think about this. You see what I, Ezekiel saw. You see this throne of sapphire. And you see this being on it that's glowing and like a fire. What do you say? Pretty much nothing, right? And to start your day that way and just go, I'm just going to acknowledge your presence. You know everything that's going on in my heart. You know what's going on in my life. I don't need to tell you. I will, you know, but I just want to be quiet for a while. You know, the reverence we had in this room, I, I, the Lord was reminding me of uh, when we started this church. It was over at Sinaloa Junior High School. We used to meet in the cafeteria. And then, uh, and then, we, then we really expanded and went over by Chuck E. Cheese. And... Uh, <laughs> And I remember there was this little room over there by Chuck E. Cheese with, uh, not actually in Chuck E. Cheese, that would have been better, you know, the, all the animals behind me, you know. Uh, but in this little room, and I remember there were, a, it got to a point where we got so crowded in there because there was like 200 of us in there. It's like, whoa, we're huge, you know, what are we going to do? And we said, you know, let's go to two services. And we made this jump, said, okay, we're going to have two services. Well, the next week when we started that new service, there were two people, okay? There were five people on stage leading worship, and I still remember that morning, as it was so special to me. There were two old ladies, and they're sitting in the crowd, and I just remember walking up on the stage and going, this is a little weird, you know? We got a full band and, 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 uh, and, and two elderly women in the back, and, and I remember looking at them and saying, you know what? God is in this room. I go, I don't know about you, but I came in here to worship him. And so I don't really care if there's anyone else in the room. I'm going to give him everything I've got. I go, I hope you didn't come here for a crowd. I hope you came to, to come into the presence of a holy God who's going to be watching us. So let's give him everything we've got. I said, you know, I know there's only two of you, but I'm going to come down off the stage. So there'll be three of us, you know, and the three of us are coming to the presence of a holy God. And let's sing like we mean it. Let's come before that throne with no shame. And I remember the two little old ladies in the back, oh, rock on. You know, just, uh, it was just, but you know what? We had a great time of worship that morning. We had a great time. And I totally remember that. It's like such fond memories of, I don't care who's here. I'm coming before God. And it was one of our best worship services. I think God looked down and said, you know, that was one of your best worship services because everyone was in it. All three of you. You guys were all into it. And... And so now with multiple services and thousands of people, I'm going, you know what? I don't want this to change, God. I don't want us to ever get away from this. Like, I don't want to have this casual attitude. I, I, I used to work at a church where the, I asked the pastor, like, how come we don't really get into worship? And he says, well, what about people that are visiting? They won't understand. If we get too into it, they'll just be like, man, why are you so into that? And I, I got to tell you, in my mind, I think, I think that's not why the world doesn't, go to church or that's not why the world is turned off by christians it's quite the opposite they walk in and go well if you really believe god's that great why are you so casual about him how come you don't live life differently than i do if you really believed in heaven and hell why didn't you tell me about it those are the questions the unbelievers are asking how come if you have the holy spirit of god inside your life how come your life looks worse than mine how come you haven't really changed how come i'm the one that's honest and you're the one that's lying to me those are the things, those are the questions why people don't believe in Jesus. It's not because we're too into God. They're just going, man, I, I don't know if you really believe that stuff. Why would you sing so casually? Why would you give so casually? Why would you serve so casually? Why would you live your life so casually? How come you never told me about this, God, if you really believed in this heaven? I, I don't get it. That's what they don't understand. I want to read one last passage and <coughs> out of Luke before... Uh, before we close, in Luke uh, chapter 7, verse 36, is my favorite picture of worship in the Bible. In Luke chapter 7, verse 36, it says this. Now, one of the Pharisees, the Pharisees were the religious leaders of the day, kind of respected, you know, honored people. Now, one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. So he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. 
when a woman who had lived a sinful life in that town heard that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume, and as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. And then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he'd know who's touching him and what kind of woman she is and that she is a sinner. And Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. He tells a story. He goes, Two men owed money to a certain money lender. One owed 500 denarii, the other just 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he canceled the debts of both. Now, which one will love him more? And Simon replied, well, I I guess the one who had the bigger debt canceled. You've judged correctly, Jesus said. And he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, you see this woman? I came into your house. You didn't give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears. She wiped them with her hair. You didn't even give me a kiss. But this woman, from the time I entered, has not stopped kissing my feet. You didn't even put oil on my head, and she's pouring perfume on my feet. So therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who's forgiven little loves little. And Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. I love that picture. Because he's saying, you know what? She gets it. She knows all the junk in her life that I forgave. I'm dying. I'm about to die on the cross for her sins. She understands this. I've forgiven her of all this stuff. Maybe you're not worshiping me. And maybe you're not coming to me because you're thinking you're pretty good. And well, I'm a pretty good person anyways. I don't really have that much to be forgiven of. So I don't, I mean, the cross is nice. You know, gets rid of those little sins that I did. He goes, but this woman isn't that way. She's thinking, no, I know what I've done in my life. And I'm blown away that you forgive me and love me and I can't control myself. I'm just kissing your feet. I took the most valuable thing I have and I just poured it on your feet. I'm crying. I'm taking my hair and I am scrubbing your feet. What else can I do? How, how can I humble myself and humiliate myself anymore? Because I got to show you that I am crazy about you. I am nuts about you. See, every time I read that story, I think, okay, who do I resemble? Honestly, do I resemble the, the, the powerful, mighty Pharisee sitting at the table talking with Jesus, discussing things, going, yeah, that was a good miracle you did. Tell me about this passage in the Old Testament. What does that mean? You, you know, and, and having these theological discussions, or am I just like that woman that just goes, no way! Man, man, I, I'll just fall at your feet. Anything. I mean, is there that side of me? You see, I, I struggle because I feel like, man, I'm, sometimes I'm just too cool. You know, I'm too reserved. I'm too, could I really? I I try to think if Jesus literally walked in this room, the Son of God in the flesh, I try to think about the individuals in the church and I go, okay, who would be the ones that would not care? That don't care about your image, aren't thinking what anyone else thinks, that aren't so self-conscious, but rather you're just God-conscious. You're going, no, are you kidding me? That's Jesus Christ. I'm just going to run up to that stage. I'm just going to start bawling, kissing His feet, and saying anything, 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 anything. I can't believe it's you. I can't believe it's you. I can't believe it's you. I just wonder, okay, who would do that and who would be kind of sitting back going, man, look at her. She's making a fool of herself. Did you see how much money she just gave? Do you realize how much she just threw? That was like her whole life savings. That's, that's not very prudent. God wants us to be good, you know, managers. And how many of you would be like that woman that just, <laughs> I don't care what you think of me. All I care about is what this God thinks. And I'm crazy about him. I'm in love with him. Two weeks ago, I was in Australia doing this conference. And worship's a little different in Australia. They get into it. I mean, it's like, good night, mate. Come on. You know, you know and they're... they're uh, I mean, it was nuts, you know, and I'm not used to that, okay? I'm I'm Simi Valley, you know, and and I, and literally everyone, literally everyone in the room is dancing as they're singing. Not just, not just... It's just, you know, and the worship leaders are up here, they're getting into it, and I'm there going... 
Uh, man, I don't have rhythm like that, you know. I'm not used to this. I'll just clap and look. And I mean, honestly, I was so stinking self-conscious. I just was. I'm just confessing. And everything in me is going, you know what? That's what God wants me to do. He would love it if I just jumped in with everyone else. But I'm from Simi Valley, and I'm a lot older than I'm like twice their age, you know, these little kids, you know, and uh, I got the flu, you know, I can't dance with the flu, your rhythm's off, you just look dumb, you know, and all of this, oh, you know, because let's just face it, man, we're so self-conscious, we are, we're so cool, and I hate reading that passage because I go, man, would I have been that woman, not that I could watch this with my hair, but you know, but would I, do I have this reckless abandon where I go, man, God forgave me of a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff. I have done a lot of bad things in my life, and he is saying that he will pay for all of that and just rush at him and give him everything I own, everything that I am. Could I be that fool for Jesus? Or am I just too cool? See, my prayer is that when God looks down in this room, and I, I'm confessing to you, I'm not there, and I want to be there. I'm just like you. You guys sometimes think, oh, he's pastor. You know, he doesn't struggle with it. I'm just like, I'm actually cooler than a lot of you. And so I, I have the same image, you know, I got the same everything, and... And even as a leader, I, I struggle with that. And there's this self-awareness that God says, man, would you just surrender to me? I just love the way he loved on that woman. Isn't that so beautiful? When Jesus goes, see, honey, honey, you know, I know these guys think you're stupid, but I'm telling you, you're doing the right thing and your sins are forgiven. See, these guys, they think they're, they were pretty good and that, you know what, I, I, you know, thanks for those little sins you forgave me of. But you know the truth about your life. And they're just, they're just faking it. They're pretending. But I know the real garbage. And you're responding properly. They're not. I want to be one that responds properly. I want Cornerstone Church to be a church that responds properly. Where God looks in this room and goes, okay, they get it. They get it. Your sins are forgiven. Don't you want to be her? And don't you confess that you're not there? but you want to be. And it's a lot easier when a bunch of people agree on that and say, let's move toward that. Let's really worship. When we come in this room, let's remember we're coming in the presence of a holy God that we would be in awe of and we would say nothing before. And then when we show our adoration to God, let's be like this woman and not worry so much of what people think. I'm not saying to make a spectacle of yourself because I've been in those places where someone actually takes the attention away from God. You want to worship and then suddenly someone's in front doing car wheels. You're going, whoa, that's pretty good. You know, it's, it's just, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying I was so ashamed because I'm in a room with people dancing for Jesus and I couldn't do it. And that killed me. And I understand, you know, that's not so much our culture, but with our hearts, with our voices, with our postures, to come before a holy God and truly adore him. That's what I want to do this morning. So the worship team is going to come up, and we're going to close with some, some adoration time before God. And if any of you want to get baptized this morning, maybe that's, that's kept you. That's like, man, that's embarrassing. I get up there, and I get in the water, and I get wet in front of everybody. and It's like, you know what? If that's the issue, then don't, don't even do it. Or be like that woman that says, I don't care. I don't care if my, mess, my hair is a mess. I don't care if I'm washing his feet with my tears and hair in the dirt. I love this God. And I want to pronounce to the world that I'm dying to the old me. And I'm going to follow Jesus now.